Dear Föberg laureates, Föberg family, dear friends and colleagues, it's a great honor for me to introduce Tony Hunter, who has been awarded the inaugural prize for cancer research by the Sjöberg Foundation. Personally, I find it very difficult to find a scientist more respected and more worthy of this important and new prize in cancer research. Tony's discovery of tyrosine phosphorylation laid the ground for our current understanding of cellular regulation in physiology, in embryonal development, and in cancer. His research has led to life-saving therapies. Back in the 70s, intracellular signal transduction was a black box. Tony's discovery became the very battery of the torch that enlightened this box. The box isn't black anymore. We now know pretty well what's in it. Tony's discovery of tyrosine phosphorylation led to a real bandwagon in molecular cancer research. First came the SARC product, which was actually the, the kinase that Tony studied without knowing it. BCR ABL, EGF receptor, PDGF receptor, insulin receptor that was searched by endocrinologists, but it was also cancer research that led the way to the insulin receptor kinase. The FGF receptor and the VEGF receptor. The interesting thing about these totally 90 ty tyrosine kinases that have been discovered is that they are actionable targets and that they are apparently expressed or structurally changed in cancer. This has led the industry, above all, to make effective drugs. And I used to call the signal transduction led by the kinases as the pharmaceutical industry's candy box. Tony's PhD was in biochemistry. The year was 1969, and his alma mater was University of Cambridge. After graduation, he moved to Salk Institute as a postdoc with Walter Eckhart to work with poliomavirus, an oncogenic DNA virus. After his postdoc, he went back to the United, to United Kingdom and searched for a job. He was turned down. He didn't get any job there, so it was Brexit Tony. Now, I won't forestall Tony's lecture because I think he should describe himself what he has contributed to. But I urge you to read Tony's original articles. It will take you a year or so. If you go to PubMed, you will understand what I mean. But there are two papers that I really recommend. One is called Treatment for Chronic Myelogenous Leukemia, Le The Long Road to Imatinib. It's a brilliant demonstration of the fundamental role of basic science for clinical medicine. Never underestimate the power of basic science. The other paper is entitled The Discovery of Tyrosine Phosphorylation. It's all in the buffer. I urge especially the young scientists so, to read this paper and put yourself in Tony's position when he noticed that the phosphoamino acid he studied didn't migrate it as it should in the, f in the second experiment, but not in the first experiment. When he used the right buffer, the new buffer, it migrated as it should. I think most postdocs, young scientists, and even maybe experienced scientists, would discard the first experiment and say, I repeated with the right buffer, it migrated as it should, it was threonine. But not Tony. He was not only clever, but he was also a biochemist. Never underestimate the power of biochemistry. What you don't know about Tony is that his middle name is Rex. Highly appropriate, I would say. Tony has rightfully been called the king of kinases. In Latin, it would be Kinosaurus Rex, 
Tony has received many prestigious awards. Gardner International Award, Mott Prize, Wolf Prize, KU Medical Science Prize, to mention a few. He's a member of the Jewish National Academy of Science and the America, American Academy of Arts and Science. He's also a member of the Royal Society of London and has received the Royal Medal. And tomorrow he will receive the Sherby Prize. And today he will give a lecture here at the Karolinska Institute. Tony. So let me start by saying how honored I am to be one of the two recipients of the inaugural Schoberg uh, Prize. And to tell you today a little bit of history about how uh, we discovered tyrosine phosphorylation, and then two projects that are in progress in the lab, which will benefit enormously from the unrestricted funds that come together with this prize. So, I didn't start out, actually, with a burning desire to cure cancer. That came later, almost by accident, really, when I ended up at the Salk Institute studying tumor viruses. But I was trained as a biochemist, and in those days, in late 1979, we already knew um, that protein... Whoops, wrong button, that's first... Um, Protein phosphorylation, where phosphate is added to a protein covalently, is a major mechanism of cellular regulation and involves two enzymes, a protein kinase, a so-called writer, which takes the phosphate off ATP and adds it to a protein to form a phosphoprotein, and we knew that this phosphate was linked either to serine or threonine, two of the hydroxy amino acids. And then a second class of enzyme, the protein phosphatase, uh, removes this phosphate, reverting the protein back to its starting state, and this sometimes is called an eraser. So we already knew about this process. In fact, uh, since then, very large numbers of additional protein modifications have been identified. Over 400 are currently known, and many of these work in the same fashion. They reversibly regulate protein activity or protein state. But phosphorylation is the most common protein modification, and there are thousands of phosphorylation sites occupied in a, in a single cell. So it's a very abundant modification that is widely used. So as Bengt already mentioned, um, I was doing a postdoctoral uh, study at the Salk Institute, and we were focusing on polyomavirus. Um, polyomavirus which is a small DNA tumor virus. We were studying this as a model for human cancer. We hoped that by understanding how a simple virus caused cancer, it might be possible to learn more about human cancer. And this virus only has six genes. And only three of those genes are involved in converting a normal cell to a cancer cell upon infection. And uh, these are the three proteins that the virus makes as soon as it gets inside the cell. They're called T antigens or tumor antigens. And uh, we had learned something about how these were made by alternative splicing. And in particular, um, this protein, the middle T antigen, uh, was mainly responsible for causing um, cancer in cultured cells in a dish. So um, we didn't know how this protein worked. How did it make a normal cell into a cancer cell? And we followed up a lead from work on another tumor virus, Rasocoma virus, work from Ray Erickson's group, who, who had reported that <clears throat> the transforming protein P60, SARC, had a kinase activity when it could use ATP to add phosphate to another protein. So we wondered whether this was a universal mechanism of viral transformation. And so we tested whether the polyomavirus proteins might also have a kinase activity. And so what we did was we isolated these proteins from infected cells using antibodies made against the T antigens. 
And then taking this immunoprecipitate, we added labeled ATP to test uh, for kinase activity. And what we found, much to our delight, was if you, if you look here, this, this lane here, um, a 60,000 Dalton band became P32 labeled. And we also had mutants of the virus. Um, some of their names are up here, which uh, didn't transform cells into cancer cells. And these seem to lack this kinase activity. So a strong correlation between kinase activity and, um, and cell transformation. Now, we weren't the only people who thought this was a possibility. Two other groups, um, Alan Smith and Mike Freed in London, and Brian Schaffhausen and Tom Benjamin at Harvard, had also uh, realized that polyoma middle T, as we called it, had a kinase activity. And as it happened, in that, that summer of 1979, Cold Spring Harbor was holding its annual symposium on tumor viruses. And all three of the, the groups were there, and we presented our data and discussed um, how we would submit these papers for publication and agreed to send them to Cell. Uh, and ours was submitted on June 11th, 1979. And it basically just described what I've shown you. And for those of you in the audience, it was just as hard to get papers published in Cell then as it is um, now. So here are the reviews of this paper. Just look at the yellow highlights here. These two findings force one to seriously consider the possibility that the activity observed in immunoprecipitates is an in vitro artifact. So that's not a very good start. Um, Here's the second reviewer, the product of this protein kinase lake reaction. Um, it was not characterized, and with the very low activity, it could be some due to a contaminant. And then here's the third review, even more damning. Unfortunately, very few of these conclusions drawn by the authors are actually clearly substantiated by the data. So in other words, the reviewers didn't believe us. But luckily, Ben Lewin was the editor of Cell at the time. And he was persuaded this was important enough to go ahead anyway, and so he told us to revise the paper. Now, um, I, the day after the paper was submitted on the 12th of June, I knew that one of the reviewers would ask, what amino acid is being phosphorylated by this kinase activity? And so I set out to identify that activity. And here is the page from my notebook, um, basically saying I'm going to, I'm going to analyze the P32 labeled middle T antigen by hydrolyzing it in strong acid and separating the phosphoamino acids that are released by electrophoresis. Um, and that's what this describes here. So that supposedly the hydrolysate is now going to be separated at pH 1.9 or 2 uh, on a thin layer plate. Um, so this was the autoradiogram of that first separation. Um, I'm sure you can't see anything there. The sample had been mixed with unlabeled phosphoserine and phosphothreonine, because uh, we knew it would be one of those two. And the, the plate had been stained with ninhydrin to reveal these markers. And these two circles here, this one and this one, are the phosphoserine and phosphothreonine. Now, with the eye of faith, you can actually see a faint smudge here on the autoradiogram. Now, you might say, well, that looks like a thumbprint. And you might have been right. But on a longer exposure for four days, now you could begin to see this spot here, right? And this spot does not co-migrate with either phosphoserine or phosphothreonine. So this was a big puzzle. Uh, how could there be a, a new phosphoamino acid? And I wrote in my notebook, spot does not coincide with phosphoserine or phosphothreonine. I thought it might be some sort of artifact. But I followed up and actually did the experiment once more with the same old buffer that I had used for the first experiment for electrophoresis. And um, I got the same result. So 
Luckily, having trained as a biochemist, I knew there was a third hydroxy amino acid that might uh, receive phosphate, and that was tyrosine. And so I decided to test this possibility whether that spot was in fact phosphotyrosine. So what we knew beforehand was that phosphate could be linked to the hydroxyl groups of serine or threonine. And what I was proposing was that phosphate could be linked to the hydroxyl group of tyrosine, which is a phenolic hydroxyl group here. So I tried to synthesize some phosphotyrosine. I'm not a chemist, I'm a biochemist, and I actually just mixed phosphorus oxychloride with tyrosine in water and got a black tar, not surprisingly. Um, but I did isolate a little authentic phosphotyrosine, and um, this appeared to migrate between uh, phosphoserine and phosphothreonine. So I suggested it might be the right thing. So this was obviously very exciting, potentially very important. But in fact, I simply left the lab at that point to raft a river in Idaho. Uh, so I, we drove up there with our boats on July the 3rd and set out to raft the Salmon River for um, a week. And then I flew straight from Idaho to London and then to Cambridge to attend the DNA tumor virus meeting and not got, didn't get back until August the 6th. So a whole month had, month had passed, and here I am rowing uh, this, the boat on the Salmon River. That's me here. We're going through a rapid here. Um, we certainly enjoyed ourselves, but I probably should have been back in the lab. In any case, um, by this time, uh, in the next month or so, we developed a two-dimensional separation for... Um, phosphotyrosine, phosphothreonine, and phosphoserine using chromatography and electrophoresis. And we pre were pretty satisfied that the product of the middle T kinase was authentic phosphotyrosine. And so we submitted our paper now on um, September the 25th uh, to back to cell with this, these new data in it. And um, the paper was accepted basically one day later. So um, Ben Lewin just decided that he would accept the paper. He also accepted the papers from the other two groups who for some reason had not been asked what the phosphamino acid was. So we were the only group to report this. Um, so I've been talking about the old buffer and I had been too lazy to make up fresh electrophoresis buffer. And what had happened is that when you repeatedly use this buffer, the pH drops um, to up pH 1.7, and that allows phosphotyrosine to resolve from phosphothreonine. And so this was a stroke of, of luck, although, you know, I did have to have some insight into what the spot might be. So um, it turns out that the kinase activity of middle T is not intrinsic, and um, a few years later, Sarah Courtney showed that the middle T associated kinase is actually due to an associated activity. So one of the reviewers was right, uh, the product of the CSARC gene. So the other stroke of luck was at the same time as working on polyomavirus, we were also working on Rouse sarcomavirus and its SARC gene product, which Ericsson had reported to be a kinase. And um, so one day I was actually running an experiment to uh, test whether phosphotyrosine was um, authentic by complete proteolysis of the label protein. And you can see you do release phosphotyrosine, so it wasn't being generated by the acid hydrolysis. But I ran a control of the um, heavy chain that's phosphorylated by SARC in an immunoprecipitate. And much to my amazement, instead of phosphothreonine, which Erickson had reported, <coughs> the uh, product of the SARC kinase activity was also uh, phosphotyrosine. And we could show this uh, by two-dimensional separation, this time yeah, using the same um, chromatography electrophoresis. Here's the product of the SARC kinase activity. And even more importantly, now we could actually show that SARC was acting as a tyrosine kinase in cells by taking P32 label control and RSV transform chick fibroblasts, hydrolyzing all of the protein, separating in two dimensions now using 
a second dimension of electrophoresis at pH 3.5. And we could clearly show that in an untransformed cell, there's a low level of phosphotyrosine, whereas in a SARC transformed cell, there's about a tenfold increase. So we were pretty convinced that SARC was not only a kinase in vitro, but acting as a kinase in vivo. So this paper actually fared a lot better. Um, here are the reviews. Um, so here's the review of one. These findings are both interesting and potentially extremely significant since phosphorylation of tyrosine has, never norm has not been previously demonstrated in cells. Um, here's review of two. Primary significance results from the fact that phosphorylation of tyrosine is such a novel activity. And the final review was handwritten, which you could do in those days. And basically it says, uh, no revision is necessary and immediate publication is strongly recommended. So the amazing thing is that, um, this, well, this paper was published in PNAS um, as a communicated article. The amazing thing is that all of the experiments starting with the um, polyoma uh, kinase assay and finishing with the VSARC kinase assay were done in less than five months. And the experiments describing the VSARC kinase activity were completed in less than a month. Uh, so we were just set up and ready to do it. So SARC was the first tyrosine kinase, but quickly it became clear there will be lots of tyrosine kinases and at the same time, the number of serine and threonine kinases was also uh, increasing very rapidly, beginning in the days in the late 1970s when it became possible to clone. And you can see that um, the number of different kinases had risen to well over 70 um, by 1987 when I made this graph. And I suggested on this basis that maybe there will be as many as 1,001 protein kinases. It turns out there are over 500 human protein kinases when the complete um, human uh, genome sequence was reported in 2001. We could actually uh, predict, based on the similarities in, in seq motifs in the kinase catalytic domain, how many protein kinases the human genome encodes. And at that time, uh, it was about 518 most of which are distributed in this tree here with the tyrosine kinases on top. And this is, for instance, the PKA uh, branch of uh, basophilic kinases here. And there are also uh, about 40 atypical protein kinases, including the important um, ATM, ATR, mTOR, and DNA PK protein kinases. This number has risen slightly since 2002 when this paper was published. We now think there are really 550 protein kinases. Uh, one sort of side note here, of these 518 in this tree, 10% um, appear to lack catalytic activity and are acting as uh, scaffold proteins instead. So how many tyrosine kinases are there? Well, uh, the VSARC and CSARC kinases were the first ones in 1979. By the end of 1980, four tyrosine kinases had been uh, reported. Um, VSARC, VABLE, EGF receptor, and VFIPS, another oncogenic tyrosine kinase. And in 1984, VRB, another oncogenic viral kinase, was shown to be derived from the EGF receptor. So the number of new tyrosine kinases uh, increased rapidly over the next few years as people figured out ways of doing PCR cloning. Um, and in, in 2001, uh, the complete human genome sequence indicated that there are 90 tyrosine kinases. And you can see them here. This is the tyrosine kinase branch of the tree. Uh, there are several uh, families of protein kinases. Here is the... Um, I'm missing it now. The SARC family is, is here, two sub-branches. And there are many receptor tyrosine kinases, like the EGF receptor uh, over on, on this side of the tree. Here's the EGF receptor here. 
So over half of these are implicated in cancer uh, as a result of mutations that increase their kinase activity or as a result of gene amplification and overexpression. And of the 550 protein kinase genes, about a third, or maybe more now, are um, implicated in human disease, with by far the majority of these being implicated in, in cancer. And it was the demonstration that there are uh, human oncogenes that act as tyrosine kinases that really sparked interest in the development of inhibitors that inhibit um, the activity of these oncogenic kinases. The efforts were first started in, in academia, in fact, particularly Alex Levitsky, but then quickly Pharma uh, took an interest in, in tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and particularly the work at uh, Ciba Geigy, which later became uh, Novartis. And there are um, currently 36 protein kinase inhibitors approved for mostly for cancer therapy, but some for other types of disease. And of these, 26 are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Whoops, I guess we lost the background here. That should be black, but it isn't. Um, what you can see here, whoops. Uh, what you should be able to see here, but, but you can't, is this is the uh, increasing number of tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have been approved for uh, human uh, clinical treatment, starting with imatinib here in 1991, um, I mean 2001, which is used to, it's an inhibitor of the bcr abel tyrosine kinase, and it... Um, has been a lifesaver for patients diagnosed early with CML. Many of the patients who went on imatinib, which is uh, uh, the trade name is Gleevec, are still on Gleevec therapy 15 years later. So this, this drug has turned a cancer into a chronic uh, disease. There are many more tyrosine kinase inhibitors in uh, clinical trials now, so this number will surely increase rapidly over the next few years. So it's obviously very gratifying that uh, a basic um, research discovery has led ultimately to the generation of a, a new type of uh, cancer therapy. So now I just want to tell you um, two short stories of work going on in the lab, which, as I say, will, be, will benefit from uh, the funding from the Sherberg uh, Award. So the first one relates to uh, pancreatic cancer. It's one of the worst cancers. Life expectancy after diagnosis is generally about a year, with very less than 5% of pancreatic cancer patients survive five years. We know quite a lot about the genesis of pancreatic cancer. It is driven by a succession of oncogenic mutations, um, KRAS, mutations that activate the KRAS gene are almost universal in pancreatic cancer, more than 90%. Uh, mutations in, f in P53, the tumor suppressor protein, are also uh, very common in SMAD4. And the disease goes through an ordered series of stages uh, with sort of carcinoma in situ, forming so-called panins in situ, pancreatic cancer in situ, followed ultimately, though, by conversion to an invasive behavior, <coughs> and then ultimately dissemination through the bloodstream uh, to create metastases. Unfortunately, pancreatic cancer is almost always uh, diagnosed too late, and so very often at the time of diagnosis, it's already a metastatic uh, disease. Now, like all solid cancers, pancreatic cancer is a community of cells. It's not just the tumor cells. There are several other normal uh, cells in, in the cancer, uh, 
Um, there are blood vessels with endothelial cells and pericytes. Um, uh, there are many cells from the immune system. And these are obviously the target ultimately for checkpoint therapy that Jim will tell you about in the next lecture. And then um, there are many fibroblastic cells, um, so-called stromal cells in the tumor. And among these, are a class that have become known as the stellate cells. So these cells all act together and support each other. And without all of them, this, this probably wouldn't, wouldn't be a tumor. So even if you inoculate uh, a, a model organism, a mouse, let's say, with tumor cells, as those tumors grow, they acquire all of these uh, other cell types. And pancreatic cancer is unusual in that it forms this very uh, dense extracellular matrix, sometimes called the desmoplastic reaction, in which nests of tumor cells are surrounded by stromal cells, particularly stellate cells, that secrete a very dense matrix that makes it hard to reach the tumor cells. Stellate cells are found in several organs, liver, pancreas, kidney, and they have a characteristic star shape, which is hence their name, stellate cell. Normally they are quiescent in tissues unless they are provoked usually by an inflammatory reaction or perhaps by uh, the growth of a tumor. And then they turn into myofibroblast-like cells which secrete extracellular matrix and a number of cytokines. So we started a project to try and understand how different cell types in, in the pancreatic tumors talk to one another, particularly focusing on the stellate cells. And what we wanted to know was what factors are secreted by the stellate cells that act on the tumor cells, and conversely, what factors are secreted by the tumor cells that act back on the stellate cells to form this reciprocal positive feedback loop. And we thought that um, understanding this could lead to new therapies because secreted proteins or paracrine factors can in principle be targeted by neutralizing um, monoclonal antibodies. So this was the work of Yu Shi, a, a postdoc in the lab, and he collaborated with Ruijun Tian, who at that time a postdoc in Tony Paulson's lab, to identify proteins secreted by cultures of um, pancreatic tumor cells, in this case, Mia PACA2, human pancreatic cancer cells, and a, a human stellate cell culture. So supernatants were collected from these cells grown in serum-free medium, and the proteins present were identified by uh, mass spec. The so-called secretomes of these cell lines are complex. As you can see, there's over a thousand cells secreted by the Miapaca 2 cells, a thousand proteins secreted by the Miapaca 2 cells, and uh, nearly 850 by the stellate cells. We were particularly interested in proteins that are uh, unique to each cell type, so about 400 proteins unique to the tumor cells, 140 to the stellate cells. Now, you always generate long lists when you do a mass spec experiment of this sort, and you have to prioritize which proteins you're going to try and study. So looking at the unique cells from each cell, uh, unique proteins from each cell type, we focus particularly on growth factors and cytokines from the stellate cells and likewise from the tumor cells. But just note one thing here is that the, the stellate cells make large numbers of extracellular matrix proteins that are unique, whereas the tumor cells don't. Oh, let me just go back. And we decided in the end, as you'll, and you'll see why, to focus on this cytokine here called LIF, or leukemia inhibitory factor. So we wanted to know what the active factors uh, were or are in the secretome of these two cell types. And so we uh, 
carried out an experiment where we took conditioned medium from the stellate cells and added it to cancer cells in culture for 10 minutes, isolated the phosphotyrosine peptides from the cancer cells, analyzed what tyrosine phosphorylation events had occurred. And you can see in red here, in the upper quadrant, the phosphotyrosine peptides that were present at the highest level after stimulation. And you can probably see, even from the back, that STAT3, in each case, these are two different tumor cell lines that were stimulated, is the most common, um, most common peptide. Now, STAT3, um, tyrosine 705, is a major site that is phosphorylated in response to cytokines, for instance, um, like IL-6. So we suspected that one of the cytokines we'd identified by mass spec was likely to be responsible for this. And so to find out what cytokine might be present, Yushi uh, set up a mere packer 2 cell line in which he stably expressed flag STAT3. He stimulated with conditioned medium from stellate cells and then um, isolated what came down with STAT3. Um, he analyzed what came down with STAT3 by mass spec. And what he found was JAK1, which is one of the tyrosine kinases that phosphorylates STAT3, so that was reassuring. He also found uh, the LIF receptor and GP130, which is the signaling subunit of the LIF receptor. So the LIF receptor, or well, LIF itself, is a member of the IL-6 family of cytokines, IL-6, IL-11, and LIF. And each of these receptor systems uses GP130 as a signaling subunit that becomes tyrosine phosphorylated, but they have unique ligand binding subunits, the IL-6 receptor subunit, the IL-11 receptor subunit, and the LIF receptor subunit. So this was why we focused on, on LIF as a potentially important cytokine secreted by the stellate cells. And activation of the LIF receptor can um, lead to the JAK STAT pathway. The activated STAT proteins are transcription factors that move into the nucleus to um, drive expression of proteins like SOX2 and OCT4, which are stem cell factors. But it can also activate the ERK MAP kinase and PI3 kinase pathway. So as a result of our secretome analysis, we had sort of ended up with a reciprocal loop in which the stellate cells, when they're activated, make LIF, which is secreted and acts on LIF receptor in the tumor cells. And I didn't show you then, but this leads to production of PDGFC, um, which then acts back on the PDGF receptor, which is uniquely present in the stellate cells. So we wanted to test whether um, LIF, leukemia inhibitory factor, is important in pancreatic cancer. And to do this, we used a mouse model in which, uh, a genetically engineered mouse model, in which um, an activated allele of KRAS is switched on by expression of CRE downstream of PDX1. So this is expressed in all the cells in the growing pancreas, beginning during embryogenesis. We also have a floxed allele of P53, which is then deleted. So you get two events, you delete P53, you activate KRAS. And these mice um, develop pancreatic cancer pretty quickly, and the half-time to um, death of the pancreatic cancer is, is around 40 days. So to test whether LIF plays a role in this mouse model of pancreatic cancer, we used a monoclonal antibody 
called D25, originally produced by Genentech for another purpose. And we could show that this antibody would block the phosphorylation of STAT induced by um, recombinant mouse lift or recombinant uh, human lift here. So we had an antibody, a neutralizing antibody, that potentially could be therapeutically useful. And at 25 milligrams per kilogram, um, which is the dose that was used three times a week, um, Yushi could show that the level of STAT3 um, staining, and it's a nuclear staining for phosphostat 3 was reduced in a significant fraction of these uh, tumor nests here. Some, some escaped, but in many cases, is very low staining. Uh, tumor cells are marked specifically by cytokeratin-19. So we set up a preclinical um, assay in which um, mice were started on therapy at uh, 32 days of age. And they received um, either the LIF antibody at 25 mg per kg or a control antibody. And gemcitabine, it's a nucleoside analog that is standard of care in pancreatic cancer. And what we found was that um, here's, here's the control mice with the control IgG, half time to death, it's about, in this case, 50 days. Um, that there was a significant increase in survival of the mice treated with anti lif antibodies. And um, you can see survival is significantly increased here, about 20%. So this is a hard model to treat. These mice have been growing tumors probably since they were born. And so these are, this is not a prevention trial, this is a treatment trial. We found, looking at the pathology of the anti lift treated tumors, uh, there were, the mice were significantly, the tumors were significantly um, more well differentiated. There was a significant increase here in the fraction differentiated cells. We also found, in collaboration with Tanish the Reyes lab at UCSD, that there was a significant drop in the levels of um, stem cell markers like uh, CMET, ALDH, and, and CD133. Uh, so potentially then a reduction in the stemness of the tumor. We did one other experiment to try and assess the role of LIF by using a conditional knockout of the LIF receptor driven by the same Cree. So now we're knocking out the LIF receptor only in the epithelial cells of the tumor. And again, just focus here uh, on the green line, which is the, uh, the strain with both alleles of LIF receptor flocks, there's again a significant increase in cell survival. So we can deduce from this that the LIF produced in the tumor is um, being is acting on the pancreatic ductal cells themselves. So obviously this is a mouse. Uh, we need to know whether LIF plays any role in human pancreatic cancer, and we've just begun these studies evaluating uh, LIF levels in, in human um, samples. So here um, we've carried out an ELISA assay for LIF. Just focus on the left-hand side here, and you can see there is a significant, at least, because this is a log scale here, at least a 10 to 50-fold increase in the level of LIF in pancreatic tumor samples compared to uh, normal pancreas. And when we've used RNA scope in situ hybridization to look for which cells are producing LIF, if you look at the, uh, the red color here for LIF, you can see it's mostly in the stromal cells surrounding the tumor cells here. This is keratin 19, um, cytokeratin 19 but there's a little of little lift being produced in the tumor cells themselves. It probably doesn't matter which cell makes the lift because the antibody will neutralize the lift and it can only act on the tumor cells. And then one final thing is that um, we've collaborated again with Rijun Tian now in uh, China to look for the levels of lift protein directly in tumors by 
targeted mass spec, parallel reaction monitoring, and we can see that the tumors have a very high level of lift compared to normal pancreas. So all of this together makes us believe that lift may be a useful target. And the next challenge then is to um, develop a, a humanized anti-lift monoclonal antibody to begin to uh, put into patients for uh, combination trials. And we're in the process of trying to do that. OK, so for the last five minutes or so, let me turn to my final topic. This is sort of nicely symmetrical. I started out telling you about uh, phosphotyrosine. I'll again remind you of the structure of tyrosine with its phenolic hydroxyl group. The phosphate um, is added to this hydroxyl group, forming a phosphate ester, chemically extremely stable. What we've been working on for the last um, couple of years now is the phosphorylation of histidine. It's another ring-containing protein uh, that can be phosphorylated, but this time, whoops, this time um, phosphate can be added to nitrogen and to either nitrogen of the imidazole ring. So you either get N1 phosphorylation or you get N3 phosphorylation. So there are two isoforms of phosphohistidine. This is distinct from any other phosphor amino acid. So these are phosphorus nitrogen bonds. These are chemically very unstable, particularly at acid pH or upon heating. So many of you probably haven't heard of histidine phosphorylation. It has been known for over 50 years now, particularly the work of um, Paul Boyer showed that present <coughs> The presence of phosphohistidine as an enzyme intermediate in succinate uh, thiokinase in bacterial energy uh, transfer systems. It's also well known in bacteria as part of the process by which two component systems signal in response to an extracellular stimulus. There's a receptor that becomes phosphorylated on histidine. This is then transferred onto an aspartate in a response regulator protein, commonly a, a, a transcription factor that gives the signal output. But phosphohistidine is also found in, in eukaryotic proteins, not only as enzyme intermediates, uh, particularly, for instance, um, histones are phosphorylated on histidine. The only enzymes in eukaryotes that we know can carry out histidine phosphorylation of proteins are these two enzymes here. Uh, NME1 and 2, or NDPK A and B, they normally catalyze the regeneration of nucleoside triphosphates, for instance, GDP, using ATP to make more GTP. There are 10 nucleoside diphosphate kinase family members. So far, only two of them have been shown biochemically to phosphorylate histidine, but some of these others may also do so. So here's a summary of uh, what we know about histidine phosphorylation in bacteria. As I've told you, there is histidine autophosphorylation, a phosphohistidine phosphoaspartate phosphorelay, forming phosphoaspartate that then gives the signal output. In, in eukaryotes, we have uh, two kinases in ME1 and 2 that can potentially carry out reversible histidine phosphorylation. These enzymes themselves autophosphorylate and transfer this phosphate onto protein. There are phosphatases, at least two, PHPTB1 is one of them, that can reverse uh, um, dephosphorylate histidine. A number of proteins have been identified in the past few years that contain phosphohistidine, particularly these ion channels, work of Ed Skolnick at, in, at NYU, and he has shown that Phosphorylation of the C-terminal cytoplasmic tail of this calcium-activated potassium channel increases its open time. And as I just mentioned, um, I think it must have run off the bottom here, histones themselves are also phosphorylated, um, particularly histone H4. So here's a summary of what we know about histidine phosphorylation in mammalian systems from a review that Steve Foose and I just wrote. 
Uh, it's found in many places in the cell, many types of protein. Um, as I said, the only enzymes we know that do this are NME1 uh, and NME2. So chemically, phosphohistine is very unstable. It's been a real challenge to study. And several years ago, in fact, 25 years ago, we thought if we could raise a, an antibody to phosphohistidine, we might learn a lot more about this process by analogy with the use of phospho antibodies generated against phosphotyrosine. And we failed in our first attempts, probably because the phosphohistidine antigen was too unstable. But, um, and what we, what we, we deduced was that we needed a stable analog of phosphohistidine to Im immunize rabbits with. And we had to wait until some chemists, particularly Tom Muir's group, uh, reported these two analogs of, uh, of phosphohistidine. They're called phosphotriazolyl alanine. They have a, a five-membered ring. It's a, a little like an imidazole ring, but the phosphate is linked to a carbon atom either in the one position or the three position of the ring. So these are chemically totally stable, and we use them. This is particularly the work of, um, of Steve Foose in my lab and uh, Jacques Marget's group, uh, chemistry group at Sanofi in Tucson, to generate a degenerate peptide in which the TZA group, the analog, is surrounded by random alanine and glycine residues and an N-terminal cysteine that couples this to KLH for immunization. And we, we were successful in raising antibodies, first polyclonal and then monoclonal antibodies. And I'll just show you one characterization slide here. So NME1, as I said, autophosphorylates on histidine. This is actually a 1-phosphohistidine. And our 1-p-his antibodies recognize this protein by blotting, but not phosphoglycerate mutase, which is phosphorylated as an enzyme intermediate on the 3 position of histidine. In contrast, our 3-phosphohistidine antibodies detect um, phosphoglycerate mutase, but not NME1. And just to show you one control here, if you boil the sample before you run the gels, you can see most of the signal for phosphoglycerate mutase goes away, as we would expect if, this is, if the signal is due to histidine phosphorylation. So we generated monoclonal antibodies, um, both for 1p-his and 3p-his. If you block pancreatic cancer cell lines with the 1p-his antibodies and you have a boil sample control in each case, you can see the main bands identified are these NME enzymes themselves, and their signal mostly goes away upon boiling, although there are other bands. For the 3p-his antibodies, we've now blotted both E. coli and 293 cells. You see a lot of bands, most of which go away with heating. So we think it's likely that uh, um, histidine phosphorylation on the three position is going to be the most prevalent event in cells. And we have generated uh, three unique 1p-his antibodies and four unique 3p-his antibodies. If you stain cells with the 3p-his antibodies, you see um, staining of two dots. You see nuclear staining, but staining of these two dots and staining of spindle poles. So we think there's a lot of histidine phosphorylation going on in, in the centrosomes and at the spindle poles. And the, the, the major question, obviously, is which proteins are getting phosphorylated. And we've used our antibodies to enrich for proteins that contain phosphohistidine. Um, and, gosh, some of these numbers got displaced. Uh, anyway, uh, so we've, we've immobilized antibodies, enriched proteins from denatured cell lysates, and analyzed them by mass spec. And you can see that, if I go on here, there are um, a number of cell cycle-related proteins, and many proteins involved in RNA biology, RNA processing, splicing, ribosome biogenesis, which may be interesting. We did identify in this global survey
uh, histone H4, um, and other proteins that we already knew contain phosphohistidine. We still need to map the sites of histidine phosphorylation in these new proteins, but we're doing that now so we can then mutate those sites and ask questions about its function. And in the last couple of slides, let me just show you um, some very new data that we have obtained in collaboration with Mike Hall's group here in, in Basel uh, with regard to a potential role for histidine phosphorylation in cancer. Um, Mike and Stravanth, his postdoc, have set up a genetic mouse model of hepatocellular carcinoma in which um, P10, the uh, PI3 phosphatase, and TSC, the uh, subunit of the gap for REB, which drives mTOR signaling, are both knocked out. And I think you can see here that these mice um, develop tumors pretty rapidly with fulminant tumors by, uh, by 20 weeks. So to learn more about these uh, tumors, um, Sravanth and Mike carried out omics analysis, and particularly they carried out, carried out proteomic analysis to look for proteins that differ between the tumors and the normal liver. And they focus particularly on kinases and phosphatases because those are of interest as uh, therapeutic targets. And what they noticed was that NME1 and NME2 are highly overexpressed in the tumors. And LHPP, which is a phosphohistidine phosphatase, is strongly downregulated in tumors. And you can see that by this plot here. You can see control for the LHPP tumor. Uh, at, Phosphohistidine phosphatase is strongly downregulated in, in this series of tumors here, whereas enemy one particularly is upregulated. So enemy one is the histidine kinase, would drive histidine phosphorylation. LHPP is a histidine phosphatase, which would decrease. So you would predict there would be increased histidine phosphorylation in these tumors. And by blotting with, um, in this case, 3P his antibodies, uh, tumor extracts, they could show that recombinant LHPP um, here decreases the signal. So this, this is the boil control in each case. So here's the, here's the untreated and the LHPP treated, and you can see a strong decline in 3P His. So it appears that LHPP can act as a histidine, phos uh, histidine phosphatase. And then strikingly, if you look at the level of phosphohistidine by, by blotting tumor tissue directly with 3P His compared to control, you can see a strong increase in several proteins here in the tumor. Um, they derived a cell line from one of these tumors. Here it is. Uh, oops, sorry. A cell line from one of these tumors, CB1. They re-expressed. Sorry, I've got to go back one more. They re-expressed um, LHPP in these tumors using an adenovirus. Uh, this decreased uh, tumor formation of these cells, but also uh, led to a strong um, decrease in the level of, of phosphohistidine in these, um, in these cells. And when these cells, as I said, were introduced back into the mouse, you can see um, or rather, so these are growing in spheroid culture. There's a strong decrease in spheroid formation and injection of LHPP expression vector using AAV strongly reduced um, liver tumor formation in the, in the double knockout mice. You can see over here. And then finally, obviously, one wants to know what the, what the situation is in, um, in people. And what they showed was that in hepatocellular carcinoma samples, you can see here, just look, for instance, at patient one. Um, you can see there's a high level of 3-phosphohistidine in the tumor, but not in the adjacent uh, normal tissue here. So all of this suggests, then, that LHPP is a histidine phosphatase that is acting as a tumor suppressor for hepatocellular carcinoma. 
consistent with this, um, hepatocellular carcinoma patients with low RNA levels for LHPP have a worse prognosis. But really to prove that this is a key driver mechanism, we need to identify the proteins whose histidine phosphorylation is upregulated in tumors, and we're in the process of trying to do that. So I'll end then here just by stressing particularly to the younger scientists in the audience how long progress in science can take. Uh, CML was identified in 1845 as a disease, and it took us until um, 2001 to develop a targeted therapeutic. And there were many threads of science that had to be um, worked on before this could happen. Rasa comavirus was disco discovered in 1911. This led to VSARC and the fact it's a tyrosine kinase. The molecular cause of um, CML was identified first as a translocation and then a translocation that creates the BCR able a gene that has elevated tyrosine kinase activity, and polyomavirus was identified in the 1950s. So all of this led ultimately then to the development of inhibitors and the approval of Gleevec um, in, in 2001. So let me stop then um, by thanking the people who did the work. Um, particularly the pancreatic cancer was carried out by uh, Yu Shi and Rujian uh, Tian. The work on the histidine, phosphohistidine antibodies was driven by Steve Foos, and we've collaborated with Thravanth at, at Mike Hall. The early work on the identification of uh, tyrosine phosphorylation wouldn't have been possible without uh, Walter Eckhart, my postdoc mentor, Bart Sefton, my faculty colleague at uh, Salk, uh, and Marianne Hutchinson, um, a research technician in the lab. And of course, without the old buffer. Finally then, thanks again to the Sherberg Foundation for their generous support. Thank you very much. So w we thank Tony for this exciting lecture, telling us about uh, discoveries already made and new ones that are presently in the making. And I think we give Tony a hand again for receiving uh, the inaugural Sherby Prize. Thank you.